We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and so if you'd care to turn your Bibles there, we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 17, uh, 22 through 24, then 32 and 33. So if somebody would like to read those verses for us. Philistines came forward morning and evening for forty days and took his stand. Then Jesse said to David his son, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this roasted grain and these ten loaves and run to the camp to your brothers. 22 through 24. Then David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line and entered in order to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, behold, the champion of the Philistines from Gath, named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines, and he spoke these same words, and David heard them. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. 32 through 33. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go forth and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, notice the Israelites and uh, the Philistines were neighbors. The Philistines were seafaring people who lived along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And we know that he, Abraham lived with them uh, in the land of the Philistines in Genesis 21. We're told uh, about that. But what we see here that uh, the Philistines and Abraham's descendants for over a thousand years uh, have had a tension between them. And so we see here that uh, when uh, God led his people even out of Egypt. He told them, I don't want you to go uh, the shorter route. I want you to go the longer route around the land of the Philistines because God didn't want his people uh, exposed to war at an early time because they'd you know, be afraid and they'd run back to Egypt. So we see here that uh, even though the land uh, the Philistines uh, inhabited really were part of the tribes of Dan and Judah. They had a tight, uh, rough time trying to keep it under their control. They never really uh, were able to take all of it. So anyway, in a fresh fight now between these neighbors, we see this uh, standoff between the Philistines on one hill and the Israelites on another hill. Now, the uh, Philistine army was feared, we're told, 1 Samuel 13, 5, because they had chariots. But because they're now on hills with a ravine in between, that nullified that advantage that they had. And so we see that they're on one side and the Israelites are on the other side. And here comes uh, their champion, Goliath, who the Bible tells us is over nine feet tall. I mean, that it's even tall for today when we've got basketball stars, you know, and they're seven feet, you know, maybe as much as eight feet, but he was nine feet uh, tall. And we're, we're told that he had armor and weaponry uh, that most people probably couldn't even lift. And we see he called out for an Israelite to face him, you know, in man-to-man -man, uh, combat. And every morning and every evening, he would go out and he would cry out to the Israelites, say, don't you have somebody to come over here and fight with me? And uh, absolutely no one would go over there. And uh, this continued to happen. Now, they had made a bargain, if you will, with each other that whoever's champion had won, that the other ones would become their servants. There wouldn't be a war that the champion would represent, you know, each side and then whoever uh, one, the other side would become their servants. Now notice David was no longer with Saul. He had been, Randy told us about last week, where he was his armor bearer and uh, Saul asked that he stay with him uh, because he really liked him a lot. And so for a while David did, but now David's back home with his father. 
evidently tending the sheep. You know, the father, you know, could only let him go so long without needing him to help because his older brothers were now fighting in the Israeli war. And so the father needed help, so David's back home. So we see here that Jesse was sending David with supplies for his brothers in the army. Now we're not told how long this standoff had been happening and an army would live off the land. Well, evidently it got so bad there's nothing more for them to eat. And so they're now, now families are sending food to their, their loved ones out in the field. And Jesse was sending David to come. And so David came and he handed off the goods he had hauled. And we see he went to check on his brothers, how they were doing. But before he could actually get to them, he heard this champion, Goliath, bellowing his uh, challenge and watching the Israelites retreat and shaking and, you know, the terrified look upon their uh, faith. Now we've got to understand that this wasn't just a, a challenge, but Saul had off, offered a big bounty to any man that would stand up against Goliath. He, he said he'd give him three things. Uh, these are before the verses that uh, we read, or in between the verses we read, or shall read for us. And 25 through 27, he said, he, if the man killed Goliath, he'd give him riches, he'd give him his daughter in marriage, and his family would be tax exempt for life. So these are the promises. You know, Saul's doing all he can to you know, try and get people to go out there and fight this giant, but none of them would. So we look at verse 32 now, and we see after David witnessed the travesty of uh, Goliath's boast and the Israelites' fear, he began at asking questions and denouncing the giant. And we see that uh, his brothers kind of deride him a little bit and told him, you know, who are you? You're just a boy, youth. He's probably still in his teens. And uh, we see that, you know, they thought he's just being boastful and he should be quiet while he's in the presence of real men. Well, ultimately, he's brought before Saul. And we see that uh, the Israelites, you know, uh, should have known they had an obvious champion that would stand before Goliath, and that would be Saul himself. We see how when the Spirit of God came upon Saul, how he'd become this great leader and how he had led him in victory before. So Saul had should have been the champion. Remember, he's a head taller than everybody else. We're told back in 1 Samuel 9, the tallest guy, he was very impressive in his looks. And he's the natural champion, and he should have been the one who went out and uh, stood before the giant. And, and in, in God's name, he should have been the one to, to fight for the victory. But, uh, you know, we ask, well, why wasn't Saul standing up for his people? You know, why wasn't he out front leading Israel? Well, remember that he had this terrible spirit that God had given him. And uh, remember, David was back home now shepherding, and so he didn't have David playing the lyre to ease this evil spirit to come upon him. And so the torment may have been worse than normal. We, we're really not sure why he didn't do it. All we know is that he should have done it. But notice... So, I, yeah. Go ahead, Barry. Yeah, on the, on the lighter side of things, guys, correct me if I'm incorrect, but, but it seems like there's some scripture that said that Saul actually offered David his armor. Yeah. And David declined because he says it's falling off me. He couldn't wear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's coming that's up. Awesome. Yep. We, we see that Saul is very hesitant, but notice young David's courage and boldness. You know, he'd already done so much to help Saul, as we just said, that he played the liar in order to soothe his spirit. We see that Saul considered him a friend and found favor uh, with David, and we see that David was doing his best to strengthen Saul's you know, uh, heart now in the middle of this hopeless situation. So David was doing everything he could, but we see that uh, Saul said, no, you, you can't go out uh, because you're but a youth. He was a teenager. And we can only imagine, you know, uh, when we have wars, who is it that we send out? 
it's it's not the old men. We sent out our teenagers. You know, 18 years we had drafts, and uh, you know, old enough as they said to uh, go and die, but not old enough to buy a beer. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not saying they should be able to. I'm just mm -hmm. contrasting this fact mm -hmm. that uh, you know that uh, we we send out our youngest and our best whenever there's a time of war. And a lot of times we, we tend to try and hold back our youth because they're exuberance, because you know sometimes the head gets ahead of what they're actually able to do. But we see that uh, Saul deemed David as being too young to uh, bear the weight of this battle. And as Barry just mentioned, he even offered him his own armor. You know, he couldn't wear it. Remember, Saul's a head and shoulders above everybody else, and so this armor would have engulfed David, you know, and he wouldn't even be able to move. And so we, we must consider that, you know, the Holy Spirit's leadership, you know, at the same time that sometimes our, our youth are exuberant, that we don't quench the Spirit, too. That is, that we don't stop them from doing some brave things they want to do simply because, in our opinion, like Saul, we think that our youth are too young. You know, it seems to me there's a couple of things in this, this last verse that uh, ought to capture our attention. That's, first of all, um, you know, Saul doesn't think that David is capable of doing it. But also, notice that last line. He says, you're just a youth. He's been a warrior since he was young. I mean, it's a, it's a contrast between Goliath, not just his size, but the fact that he has experience. And David, in this passage at least, Saul says, you know, you're just a shepherd. Yeah. What do you know about fighting? Uh, it's not just your youth, it's also your inexperience. Uh, I'm also led to think about Paul writing to Timothy. Here's a, Paul in the New Testament writes to Timothy, a, a young man, and he's giving him very sound advice, where Saul has lost the Spirit of God. Paul has the Spirit of God and is able to help Timothy become the great preacher that he, that he became. Yeah, and said, so don't let anybody look down upon you right. because of your youth. Right, exactly. Barry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, isn't this a prime example of uh, the full armor of God? What David had, uh, you couldn't see it on the outside, mm -hmm. but his favor, his favor by God, trapped that full armor on the inside. Mm -hmm. I think this is a real example of, of what that armor he wore really is. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Okay, well, we come to our next uh, section. It's verses uh, 34 through 40. Do we have a reader for that? Okay. I can read. Okay, if you would, John. Verses 34 through 40 in chapter 17. Okay. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. You, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic, right, walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot, I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Okay. Now in light of Saul's doubt, that he couldn't do it. David made his case for accepting Goliath's challenge here, but we see that uh, his fighting prowess uh, or his uh, worthiness are, are really 
not what's in line here. We see that David gave the testimony how the Lord has strengthened and rescued him. And this thing about David, you know, the real contrast between David and Saul is that David continued to rely upon the Lord, while Saul continued to rely upon things, as Randy just said. You know, the former training of the Philistine and uh, tried to give him his armor, as we'll talk about, and, you know, all these other physical things that, you know, he, he had his eyes on, on the physical realm, on the temporary things, whereas David kept his eyes upon God. And uh, notice here, he, he gives his testimony here. People have trouble, you know, saying, you know, how am I to give my testimony? But, you know, one simple definition uh, really is of a testimony is sharing what God has done in your life. It doesn't matter how you do that. It doesn't matter, you know, if you share, you know, what you were like before you were saved, how God saved you, you know, maybe some hopeless or hopelessness you felt, or how your life has changed afterwards. But you just need to talk about how you were a sinner and you needed God's forgiveness. And in your hopelessness, you cry out to God, and, and God heard your prayers, and, and He saved you. And the Bible teaches that once we're saved, we have peace with God, peace with men, and peace within ourselves. And all this is part of giving a testimony. And that's what we find that really David is doing to Saul. He's, he's giving a testimony. He's, he's talking about all the things that God had done for him. Uh, remember, he's a teenage shepherd. He stood up to lions and bears. He taken lambs from that had taken lambs from his flock, and we see that uh, David identified the source of his strength. Though, and each time, in his hand-to-hand -hand combat with them, these animals, he says the Lord rescued over and over. David continued to give God the glory, and not take any for himself. Nowhere does David say, "I did this" or "I did that." He said, I was enabled to do these things, but it was by the hand of the Lord. And because of this testimony, notice that Saul relented and gave Shepherd his blessing, not because of David's exploits, but because David's faith in the Lord. Saul had had this faith at one time. He had lost it because, you know, God taken the spirit from him and given him this evil spirit. But he knew what it was like to be under the protection of God and to have his spirit upon him. So as we we talked about, he tried to give him his armor. He tried to and engulfed him, as we said. And David says, I, I can't fight in this. I'm not used to it. Well, how, is he, how did he fight the lion and the bear? Well, he, he did it like he did as a shepherd. He, and this is why he took the items that he did when he went out to Goliath. He took his staff, his shepherd's staff, <coughs> and probably had a little hook on it. Uh, we, we see that he it said he took his sling, and as he approached Goliath, he found five smooth stones in the creek, and he put them in a shepherd's bag. So he wasn't going out in his own power, though. He was going out in the power of God. And he knew that God could do to this giant what God had done to the lion and the bear. Uh, who and imagine a bear, especially a grizzly bear, you know, doing, trying to fight it off. <coughs> you know, if if God could give him victory over a bear, what is this rough old giant? How's he stand a chance before God? And so we see that uh, Saul did relent and. Uh, you know, as we think about David giving the description that he fought a lion and a bear, we think of uh, 1 Peter 5, 8, where it says the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. And we may think to ourselves, well, how can we stand up to our giants, you know, our, our to Satan? You know, how can we stand up when he attacks? Well, James 4, 7 gives us the answer to that. It says, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So, like God. David, we don't fight in our own strength. We don't, you know, fight enemies alone. We need to take our stand and trust God to fight for us. Barry? 
Yeah, you know, coinciding with what you're saying that is absolutely the truth. So, uh, I immediately thought of Randy. Kidney failure. Had to have a new kidney. Well, that's a form of a lion or a bear. You still got some time going through your radiation. Me, sitting on a scooter talking to you guys who can't walk anymore with bone cancer. That's a metaphor. Uh, <laughs> we, right here with us, and there's others in the room that we haven't spoken of that, man, we've went through some lions and bears, and, and we may have to face Goliath. But if we stay faithful and true, like David did, we will be as successful. And that is so cool. You know, I, I, you got that old adage out there that we've all heard many times. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, if it's in Christ, that's the truth, yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, we see that uh, um, all these things are applicable, you know, to our lives today. I mean, we don't have literal giants. But we do have spiritual giants. We do have challenges. We do have, you know, things, uh, wars to fight. And uh, we've got to have this attitude that David had, that I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And uh, that's really it. Jim, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just more what we've been talking about. Uh, for years, uh, you know, my, my belief was there for many years, but, you know, I didn't include God. I didn't include Jesus. And once I did include him, um, you know, my son's cancer that, that he went through and, um, you know, uh, me going through a nasty divorce and, and things of the like, you know, once I realized that Jesus was there with me, that his spirit was with me, it, it took away so much of the tension, so much of the uh, worry, and I'm a worry ward anyway. But, you know, it, it, it just changed everything for me. Uh, thank God. Amen. Yeah, that's... Amen. That, it, we, we struggle because our first thought is not to go to God. I think as human beings, our first thought is to try to solve this on our own, you know. What can I do? How can I stop this? How can I cause to have a different outcome? And it causes struggle, and like you said, Jim, it, it causes worry. And we know that Jesus tells us in Matthew 6 that we're not to worry. You know, that we're to put God first in His kingdom and all these other things to be added to us. And so, uh, it, it takes time to learn. And sometimes we've got to suffer because of our foolishness. And I think it's a sign of maturity that we do grow to the place where finally we understand, well, I've got to take this to God from the very beginning and put it in His hands. And when we do this, then we, we find the victory. You know, I think uh, looking at this particular passage, um, <clears throat> it's hard sometimes for young people who are in school to see the benefit of the education they're receiving, whether it's mathematics or language or whatever. Um, I'm sure David wasn't thinking, oh, someday I'm going to take the, what I'm learning here out in the woods with the, uh, or out in the wilderness with the sheep and, and you know, slinging stones around, probably practicing. Uh, you know, what's it, what, what good is this going to do? I'm sure he never thought about that. And yet here it is, even a few years into his life, that he uses a skill that God allowed him to practice, allowed him to become good at, um, in a very in a way that you would never would expect, and I think that's true of many lives today. That sometimes we, we we go through experiences and we think, well, you know, what use is this? I I just can't see any use in this. I've always thought that every time you get a job, you should learn everything you can about that job, because you never know when something that you learn there is going to transfer to another job, maybe one that pays better, maybe one that has more authority, more you know influence and then whatever you learn in that second job is going to transfer to a third job you see we're always thinking about the immediacy but we're never thinking about the long-term impact of things that we ought to be learning and I think this is a good example that no matter how simple it may be God can use even the simplest skills in a way that benefits his his kingdom 
Yeah, I wouldn't want to go up against hey, that just a sling today. Hey, no, man. absolutely not. Yeah. yeah, David didn't have an iPhone. You know, he could sit out there and play games. And, right, yeah. <laughs> it, I imagine it's quite boring at times. Yeah. And so in order to pass the time, he probably <clears throat> did. As you said, I've never even thought about but he probably practiced throwing his stones at bigger rocks or at small animals. Or target practice. Yeah, you know, I mean, all this that, you know, just to... Make the dullness of the day, you know, go by in order to get back home. And so, uh, yeah, we, I think a lot of people think the same thing about reading their Bible. You know, it's dull. I've read it before. I'm not getting anything out of this. But we really don't understand how God is applying it to our soul, how He's applying it to our minds. We, we think about Jesus' temptations. And the way that he was over able to overcome the devil every time was by reciting a Bible verse. Yeah. Yeah. Now we don't need to know the exact you know, book or even the verse that it comes from as long as we remember the content. And the only way we're going to have that content in our minds and our hearts is if we read the Bible, which a lot of people says is boring and, and say, you know, especially when they get into the bigots and mm -hmm. all the other parts of the Bible, but the only way they're going to have victory over sin is by continually reading the Bible over and over and over again. And we may, like you said, think we're not getting anything out of it. But that's to deny God's ability to take these boring things in our life and to use them at a further time. You know, there's a side note. In our, in our Bible, there, our book, there's a side note about the slain. And I always thought of the slang as, as a rock. It was a kind of a small, small rock. But according to this, it was the size of a tennis ball. Now, if you get a big rock, I mean, I've thrown rocks at squirrels before, with about the size of my hand. I never hit one. <laughs> but, uh, but you think about a rock, that, you think about a rock the size of your hand, and if that thing is slinging around and you're letting that thing go at about 100 miles an hour, that's like having a baseball harder a rock the size of a baseball coming at you that thing can do some damage right. and i never really thought about the size of it before yeah very very yeah guys uh <laughs> this is this is prime time uh, as we discuss this and gee all the years guys i was in the same category doug man i being compelled by others to read the bible but it's boring and so for many years, uh, I would talk my salvation, but I wasn't really learning to grow on my own time. So the key here as I see this is once I acquired, it's been a, a number of years ago now, but there were many years that I hadn't. I was born again. Uh, I believe in God and Jesus, but I didn't really know who the Holy Spirit was. I didn't really pray for the Holy Spirit's will with my will to teach me to, to see the Bible isn't boring at all. And as we read scriptures repetitiously through our lives, boy, it behooves us to do it. And the exciting thing is, is now, guys, when I go to the Word, oh, I'm not bored at all. I can't wait to get new revelation and new discernment and direction for his kingdom among men here on a beautiful earth. So the message is, the Bible will always be boring to you, and you can be saved if you don't form a direct personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. When you make him your divine teacher and friend, then you're excited about getting in the Word every day. Yeah. It, it, it is... It is wonderful uh, when you do get past that boredom, uh, and I've got a ways to go to reading the Bible. Don't don't uh, make mistake about that. But you know, uh, it's amazing how directly it speaks to me or to anyone else that reads it in earnest. How it speaks to me. I mean, uh, that's the amazing part. Uh, that I see in it. You know, God raises up, raises up people to serve Him and, you know, do many things on His behalf. And a lot of the training in itself may be boring. Think of David Harness. 
you know, who was our piano player here who died, how many years he practiced, you know, and I'm sure playing the scales and mm -hmm. different things get boring and everything else, but he used his music in a way to fight for God. Uh, he used it in such a way as to bring praise and glory to his name. And all the hours of practice, he could have said, oh, well, this is boring and nothing ever accomplished. There's a lot of people who took piano lessons never, you know, begin. And the same could be said for guitar or, you know, any other instrument. Uh, if, if you don't keep it up, if you don't do the boring things, you never get to be proficient in it. And uh, you really can't use it the way that uh, God can use you uh, to glorify his name. And, they, they give us a list of things here that people can use to, they say, fight on God's behalf. But it says, the Lord has been training us to use the tools at our disposables. Maybe yours is a keyboard, a guitar, a sewing machine, uh, to bring Him glory. And maybe we can do that with a joke, a hug, or the ability to listen well. Well, maybe you soothe angst teens or talk easily to people in nursing homes. But we're to use those tools to point others to God's love, mercy, and grace. And I think that's so true. You know, David took the boring things, you know, throwing stones out in the desert, out in the wilderness, and uh, we're to take things that uh, are at our disposal, get proficient at them, and then to use it all for the glory of God, however he may desire that we use it. I don't think God Yeah, well, guys, we don't do that. We'll do that next door. We'll do that next door with our neighbors. Well, sure. Right. Friends, families, right. neighbors, all of them. You had something you want to say? No. You know, just as we go into this next section, it makes me wonder what was David thinking as he walked towards the battlefield? Was he excited? Was he afraid? Did he feel inferior to this giant? You know, we see that whatever thoughts he had, and we don't know exactly what he was thinking, he was putting his trust in the Lord. And so this gets us to the victory in chapter 7, verses 45 through 51. Somebody want to read that for us? Okay, Tom. Thank you. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and of the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. <coughs> and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword or and spear, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. <clears throat> and it came to pass, when the Philistine arose, and came and drew nigh to meet David, and David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, and took thence a stone, and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, but the stone sunk into his head, his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, and took his sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Okay, notice first, verse 45 through 47, that Goliath was ready for battle. Not only had he been a warrior, as Saul said, all of his life, and fitted with exceptional armor, but he was aided by a shield-bearer who went before him. And, uh, but notice, not much of Goliath's giant self was vulnerable. And this fed his uh, taunt, you know, that he... He felt so secure, you know, behind all his armament. And uh, we see the boy came before him. And uh, remember, he's a youth, healthy and handsome, as the Bible had told us about him. 
And so Goliath didn't show him any respect, you know, and he just began to curse him and uh, he actually made a curse by uh, his own gods, by that is the God of the Philistines. Now David is already offended on behalf of his God for Goliath's defiance of Israel's army. So David made a stand not by his own power or weapons, but by the power of his God, he says, the Lord of armies, he was fighting, not only for his people, not only for David, but primarily for the God who had been with him in each of his previous battles. Uh, the teacher's book is a side note. It says, it's funny to note that David, unaccustomed to trash talk of warriors, simply repeated Goliath's threats from 1744 with a slight change from Goliath's gods to his god. Uh, he had been a shepherd, he'd been alone out in the field and, and so he didn't know how to trash talk like Goliath did, so he just turned his own talk uh, upon him. Now, David's confidence in the Lord was unmatched. He believed that God would grant him an amazing upset victory <clears throat> and it would begin with Goliath's death and all the audience around him on both sides of each hill would be the audience. And so we see he boasted that all the world for generations and generations to come would know that there is a God in Israel. And both the Israelites and the Philistines would see firsthand that the Lord saves, but he doesn't need the weapons of the world to do so. And this is the interesting thing. Here's Goliath with all his armor, his shield bearer. It, it took a man just to lift the shield and go before him and, you know, all his stature and everything else. And yet here comes this youth, uh, Rudy and handsome coming before him with no armor whatsoever. <clears throat> he didn't even have a sword. He just came in a shepherd's outfit with his staff and with his sling. And I'm sure to Goliath it was a funny sight. You know, he looked upon this and he thought, well, this is like a gnat. This is like a flea coming out to fight against me. And so this is the reason he cursed him that they didn't have a powerful warrior like himself to come out uh, and fight against Goliath. He actually called David a dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's just a dog. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so David was... And, uh, there's another old adage there, Randy. Better to be a live dog than a dead lion. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. So we see that David was confident in God's protection that God would give him the victory and God would be glorified in his exhibition of power and Israel's God would not be conquered. And so whenever we stand to give testimony about our God, neither should we be shy or cowardly or have fear. We should have confidence in the God who saves and we should boldly be able to proclaim this to anyone who comes before us. Now notice verse 48 through 51. This is really the climatic battle of the whole thing where Goliath moves towards David first. And words like lumbering, I mean, he's nine foot tall. You know, maybe even thundering with all his armor, you know, coming uh, to this little shepherd boy. But notice David didn't stand back. David ran towards him. He didn't run away. He ran towards this giant. And without any hesitation, we see that he reached into his bag and he pulled out one of the smooth stones that he had gotten out of the creek. But in David's mind, remember, the battle was always the Lord's and he already had the victory because God was with him. Now for the this being the climatic battle, you know, the fight itself was really anti climatic because it was over almost as soon as it began. There was shorter than all the speeches that they had given before. <laughs> yeah. David simply puts the stone in his lings, twirls it, lets it go, and it hits Goliath in his forehead and he falls forward and he's dead. Or at least unconscious. We're yeah. not really told yeah, until David point. actually goes and grabs the sword out of the mm -hmm. sheath and then cuts his head off. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was forceful enough that it knocked him out. And, and so we see here that uh, it reminds me of a fight uh, not too long ago that was on paid TV, I don't know, 
three, four, five years ago, where it lasted 34 seconds. And those people paid $60 to watch this fight in 34 seconds. The fight was over. <laughs> You know, and if you had gone to get a soda or something, you come back, it was already over and done. <laughs> well, this is the way this whole battle with Goliath was. It was over before it began. David simply came out, slung a stone, and that was it. And probably the most uh, dramatic thing is him trying to lift Goliath's sword and uh, haw it back to cut off Goliath's head. Just the sheer weight of the sword probably was enough force to cut off Goliath's head. I think you have to remember that <clears throat> they're on two different hills. Mm -hmm. There's a valley between. And I mean, the battle line would have been probably at the valley, at the bottom of the valley, right. typically. <clears throat> if that's the case, you've got Goliath com you know, coming down one hill, but you've got David coming down the other. And uh, I, I kind of think, I just wonder, while he's coming down the hill, he's building a little momentum. Goliath is too, but so mm -hmm. is David. I wonder how much momentum there was between David and Goliath coming down at a pretty good pace, as tall as he is, and David coming down. And when he slangs, puts that slang, he not only has just his own power, but he's got the momentum of coming down that hill behind him. I, I just shudder to think about how much power there was in that, in that stone as it leaves the sling and, and hits Goliath in the forehead. And I think you're right, I think Goliath is wounded. He goes down. He's unconscious, probably. He goes down. But notice what David said. He said, I'll strike you down. He did. And now I'll remove your head. Now, if you go down to 51, it says that he, he, uh, he stood over him after he, he'd gone down. He grabbed the sword, pulled it from his sheath, and he used it to kill him. I don't think Goliath was dead from the stone. He was dead when David went over, pulled his sheath up, his, his sword out, killed him, probably stabbed him to death, and then took the same sword and cut the guy's head off, Goliath's head off. I mean, just think about the, how much power there is in this in this little battle. Uh, I the whole thing, but there was some the army ran away. And the army ran, well, yeah, I'd be <laughs> running away, too. <laughs> you know, guys, if this is, again, uh, using the term, if this is in prime time, uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18 if this isn't a prime time example of the full armor of God and the strength that not only David had but it's been passed on to us right now and if we understand the six main components of that full armor and there's so many layers in each one of them my endorsement is and pray for Barry we need to spend some time here we need to recognize we are victorious spiritual warriors for the kingdom of God because of what Christ did. And we need to take responsibility for that armor that we have, maybe fight a few more Goliaths. Mm -hmm. I do have a question, and that's, David picked up five stones, but apparently he only used the first one. Mm -hmm. Doesn't say anything about the other four. Yeah. I, just, I wonder why did he pick up five stones? I, I don't have an answer. I have a question. Only if he missed. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you got a six shooter. You got, yeah, I guess so. It only takes one bullet. Yeah, it takes I mean, one bullet, but you, you, got, a, you got a six shooter. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, you, got a, you got something reserved, you know. Randy, may I address that? Sure, sure. Well, I, uh, is it that important? Well, it's not important that I fight this big giant, this bad dude. There's a portion of me that's human and flesh. Uh, gee, I, I got to take more than one. Uh, <laughs> Maybe so. Kind of like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Oh God, take this cup from me, man. Then all of a sudden he realized that, no, nah, this is what you called me to do. Yeah. I think these are similar stories. He grabbed more than one stone, which was all he needed because of flesh fear. Yeah, could be, but, could be. But he still, but he still when he needed one stone. Yeah. You know, one thing that stands out here is that it says the stone sank into Goliath's forehead. Uh huh. And so it was a wow. powerful throw. Oh yeah. Whatever it did, it would penetrate the skull. Yeah. Uh, even if it didn't kill him, right. you know, it was enough to 
cause maybe brain damage. You know, <laughs> you know they, in, the, in, the, in the story of Troy, it says that uh, um, Achilles had one, one place that he was vulnerable, and that was in his heel. And when an arrow, and he didn't die until an arrow pierced his his heel. Then he died. And I wonder if maybe Goliath was just had a thin skull or something. I don't know. <laughs> maybe he had maybe he had a weakness too, the thin skull. Everything else was covered except for his face. It absolutely was. So yeah. He had protection. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah. God. Well, I know one thing. I know one thing. I I wouldn't be I wouldn't want to be around David if he didn't like rock music. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, we're, we're towards the end, and yeah. the conclusion really is this narrative <laughs> is that Goliath taught at the beginning where he wanted an Israelite champion to face him one on one. And remember, we said if the Philistines won, then Israel would be their slaves. And then if uh, Israel won, they said they would be their slaves. Well, what happened is that they didn't keep their part of the bargain. That's right, they sure didn't. It's because as soon as their champion saw his head cut off, uh, they ran away. And because of this, we see that the Israelites uh, ran after them. Mm -hmm. And we see in verses 52 and 53 that after the Philistines fled, that Israel armies pursued and struck many of them down. So you see, really, David's victory points really towards his future descendant, Jesus, uh, in the victory that he would have on the cross and resurrection. Both of them prove that the Lord is the one who saves. He saved Israel from Goliath, and he saves us from our sins. But behind both of these acts, the Lord God is the one who is the one who's causing these things to happen. It wasn't David. David took no credit. It wasn't his accuracy with the sling. It wasn't his ability. It wasn't his you know, being better. It was his faith in God. <coughs> that God directed that stone. And it's not to say that he didn't use David's accuracy, but he made sure that that stone went exactly where it needed to go. And David gave God the glory for it. And in the same way, Jesus came to do his Father's will. And his Father's will was that he would die upon the cross and be resurrected from the dead in order to make salvation available to each and every one of us. And so we're so Ooh, thankful. Somebody shout. Yeah, amen. Somebody shout, so the message is done. The message is, don't be slingers, be slingers. <laughs> All right, we'll take that. <laughs> and that will end. That's right. <laughs> Let's bow forward for her. Right. Thank you for another good Bible study. Thank God for all of you people, and uh, you you bring me strength every time I take Bible study in with you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank God. Let's That's have right. a word of prayer. Right, you're better, Randy. All right. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We come to you now at the end of this uh, session. We thank you, Lord, for the uh, the word that has been uh, delivered. Thank you for the preparation Doug has given to this. Um, we pray now, Lord, that uh, we, we that just take this lesson and, and use it, Lord, to strengthen us during the week when we also face our Goliaths. Um, go now as in the after service and uh, bless the, the pastor as he brings the message of the worship service as it unfolds. Um, help us to, to come again next week anticipating a more from, the, from your word. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Jim.